All right, guys, how's it going? Right, so after that video, I guess I'm going to have to clarify some of the points I made in it. And also, a lot of the points that people raised, for example, could it be AMD sandbagging? Or is it a lowly clocked engineering sample? Or could it be drivers that are so bad? That sort of thing. So what I'm going to start with is, is AMD sandbagging? Now, AMD is a company that does not sandbag, or they haven't done it in a very long time. But you may look at the Ryzen reveals recently and think, well, they've been sandbagging there, but have they really been doing that? Before I get to Ryzen, let's start with the Polaris 11 demo way back in December 2015, January 2016. Now, if you remember, Star Wars Battlefront in Beggar's Canyon, and they showed Polaris 11 against the GTX 950. And the big thing here was the performance per watt, where Polaris 11 had a massive lead. Now what AMD had done, and this is a tactic which they have often employed recently, they locked the Polaris GPU to 60 frames per second, vSync on, and it was also running with a very low clock speed of 875 megahertz. Now what this ended up with was brilliant performance per watt. People said that this was bullshit, but I proved it in a recent video when I showed my own system with the RX 460 getting the same 85 watts power draw. So it wasn't bullshit. However, they were putting their best foot forward. We know that Polaris 11 is very, very efficient at low clock speeds. As soon as you raise the clock speeds, the efficiency goes out the window. AMD was not sandbagging, they were showing their very best. Later on, we saw a demo with Hitman, Polaris 10. Once again, V-Sync capped at 60 frames per second, which at the time was said to be on similar performance as the R9 390X. We know that Polaris 10, the RX 480, just falls a little bit short of the R9 390X. But if you followed the benchmarks back then, you would have believed that Polaris 10 was at least as fast as the R9 390X. Once again, they were clearly not sandbagging the performance of Polaris 10. And in fact, we're quite clearly showing it as best case again. If you've been following Zen recently, or Ryzen, then you will probably know that the rumoured clock speeds at release will be 3.6 GHz base clock, 4 GHz turbo clock, now, AMD demoed Ryzen back in August at only 3 GHz. So you might think, well, that's them sandbagging. They were clearly sandbagging then. But no, they weren't sandbagging because they also showed the i7-6900K at 3 GHz. The Zen CPU finished the Blender benchmark just slightly ahead of the i7-6900K. What AMD was showing here was that they were ahead in IPC instructions per clock at the same clock speed. At the end of December, they once again put their best foot forward. At this stage, AMD revealed that Ryzen would launch at a minimum of 3.4 GHz base clock. And once again, in Blender and Handbrake, they pitted the newly revealed Ryzen CPU against the i7-6900K once again. Now, the i7-6900K was right out of the box, whereas the Ryzen engineering sample had been artificially locked to 3.4 GHz, i.e. no turbo. Now, in Blender, both CPUs finished around about the same time. And from this result and the previous Blender result at 3 GHz, we could extrapolate that the i7-6900K was probably running at 3.5 GHz during the Blender demo. So you might think that, well, AMD was clearly sandbagging there. But in actual fact, what they were keen to show this time was that Ryzen was better in performance per watt. Because during the demo, the Ryzen platform consumed less power. So we've now had two Zen demos, one showing higher IPC, one showing better performance per watt. And if AMD does one more Ryzen reveal before launch, it may well show better performance, basically showing the grand slam over the i7-6900K. But the point here is clear. AMD has not been sandbagging, and AMD does not generally sandbag. They are always keen to show their products in the best possible light. Right, so next up, could AMD simply have shown a lower clocked engineering sample, much like they did with the August Ryzen sample? Well, that is certainly possible. And in the previous video, I did mention that they also showed the card inside a very small chassis, which had the vents taped up. Now, clearly this isn't an optimal situation for a gaming GPU, but the same website, PCGH, who told us about the taped up vents, and compared the performance of Vega and Doom to the GTX 1080, they also said that the Vega graphics card was noticeably noisy 
Now, they did say that the GPU could be throttling, which is obvious because it's in a small chassis with taped up vents. But the fact that the graphics card was noisy makes me think that the way AMD got around this was simply by increasing the fan speed. Now, clearly, this is not what we will see with Vega on release. They may well go with water cooling again. But the point here was, even if they had a lower clocked engineering sample, they can always overclock it and they can always ramp up the fan in order to keep the temperatures down. The biggest issue I have with this theory is that why would they show a slower Vega GPU? Given what we've seen before, where it's clear that AMD does not sandbag, why now show a slower Vega GPU? And don't forget, the Doom demo which they showed was a pure performance demonstration. They even removed VSync so we could see the exact frame rate while playing Doom. They didn't compare it to anything else. They showed the frame rate was well above 60 frames per second, which is an interesting point, which I will touch on at the end. But here's the thing. We know that Vega is coming in the first half of 2017. So within the next five months, what this means is that almost certainly right now, the final Vega Silicon is running through the fabs. This means that AMD has the final Vega Silicon in their hands. They must have had it for a month or two. They will not go ahead and mass produce Vega until they know that they have got the silicon that they want. If you think back to the Polaris launch again, AMD showed us Polaris 11 in December 2015. Polaris 11 didn't launch until August 2016. That is eight months later. Now, even if we go with Polaris 10, which launched in the middle, what was it, June? So right in the middle of 2016, yet we know that they were demonstrating very good silicon at the end of 2015, it takes around two and a half to three months for a graphics chip to be manufactured. And after that, AMD needs to get the chips back from Global Foundries. And they then need to test them. They need to bin them. They need to ship them out to their partners. They need to attach them to graphics cards and send them out to guys like me in the press. This takes a long time. So for sure, they have got the best Vega Silicon. If AMD is telling the truth about a first half launch in 2017, they must have the final Vega Silicon. So what is the point in showing slower Vega Silicon? So the last consideration for me was drivers could be in a really bad state. And once again, from the event, PCGH reported that no Vega optimized driver was used. It was simply a Fiji driver, that's Fury X, with a little additional debugging work. And so it's natural to assume that drivers will improve over time. Obviously, this is always the case with graphics cards. The issue I have here is just how much are drivers going to improve? Again, if I go back to the Polaris demo, where they showed Polaris 11 running Star Wars Battlefront at 60 frames per second. This was in December. The graphics card launched in August. And in both cases, the performance is around about 60 frames per second. I know this because I tested it and presumably the performance had not dropped since the initial test. Now it's fair to say that Polaris wasn't quite the huge architectural change that we were led to believe it would be. And Vega for sure is a much, much bigger architectural change. But you still have to say, what is the maximum from drivers that is likely to come from Vega? A lot of people said that Doom is best case. And even PCGH here are saying that Doom with Vulcan is a best case scenario. But in my last video, I pointed out that it was unlikely that Vega had these optimizations, which makes the AMD card so good in Doom Vulcan. So there is performance there to be gained. I am pretty sure of that. And just simply getting better drivers will improve performance. But my issue here is, let's say it matches even Titan X. It's going to need another 30% or so at 4K in order to match the Titan X reliably. Even if it makes that from drivers, this looks like it will be AMD's best GPU on 14 nanometers. And Nvidia has got a lot of room to grow. They aren't even using HBM. HBM memory controllers are a lot smaller than GDDR memory controllers. Nvidia will regain some power back from using HBM. And this could give them another 150 millimeter square plus of die area, GPU die size, in order to increase performance more. If they go for that, if NVIDIA releases an HBM2 GPU at around 600 square millimeters, it is going to absolutely crush Vega by an unimaginable margin. This is my problem here. Even if drivers improve, they would need to improve performance by about double for AMD to stand a chance against NVIDIA's best with this graphics card. And that's why I said it is simply not good enough. Look. 
Nobody is more disappointed than I am. My bloody channel revolves around AMD technology because I find them a very interesting company and I feel that they have had a raw deal from the press, from consumers, and I really admire their technology. But sadly, in this case, it looks like they have given up on gamers and gone for the professional segment. I have looked at all the slides. I cannot believe that Vega performs so close to the GTX 1080. Looking at the slides, looking at what they are saying about the performance uplift, and then looking at the Doom demo, their own demo showing us clearly how Vega performs. I just cannot believe that that is all the performance it has. But even with another 50% performance, there is nothing they can do if Nvidia decides to crush them out of sight with a massive GPU on HBM. And this is the thing, yeah? Middle of 2017, Nvidia are gonna refresh Pascal. It will be slightly faster. They can always drop the price of the GTX 1080 down to where it should have been around $300. I've said it before, I'll say it again. The GTX 1080 is a mid-range graphics card at a high-end price. It is at a high-end price because there is no competition. Nvidia could ditch GDDR5X from that card, sell it for $300, and it could even be 30% slower than Vega, and it will still sell by the millions, while AMD struggles to compete against GP102. The Titan X, or the 1080 Ti if Nvidia ever decides to release it. It's the same story with Fury X. Nvidia released the 980 Ti because Fury X would have made the Titan X look bad because the Titan X was massively overpriced. So Fury X came in at $600 and it didn't look very good against the similarly priced GTX 980 Ti. The same thing will happen again. The point is, Nvidia is charging massive amounts for cards that they shouldn't be charging. They are already making all the money. They can shove everything down a tier to where it should be and then launch this massive 600 square millimeter HBM2 GPU. And there is simply no way that Vega can compete with it because AMD needs to make money in the markets that buy their cards. Very few consumers bought Fury X, but Google bought thousands of them. They probably sold more of these cards to the professional segments than they did to consumers. AMD is a company, they need to make money. Vega looks like a graphics card built for the professional segment with a bunch of stuff that is not really going to work that well in gaming. Now, I've got no doubt whatsoever that in two or three years time, Vega will be faster than Titan X. We see it all the time. Once the developers start using the memory, the FP16, all the new stuff like the primitive shaders, once the developers start really using Vega, it will be a very fast GPU. But how long is that going to take? How long did it take for asynchronous compute to be used? It was about four years before we even saw a game using asynchronous compute. It just looks to me like they've done it again. It's a very difficult situation for AMD to be in. I've talked about it in plenty of videos, how they just cannot sell to consumers and how they are making massive industry changing moves. AMD is basically trying to force Nvidia out of the game because it's the only way they can possibly win against Nvidia's mindshare. But these things take time and with every new architecture, it is basically like a reset button. Now the developers need to learn all the new stuff in Vega coming through the consoles, but it's gonna take years before we see the fruits of their development. In the meantime, Nvidia will continue to sell fast graphics cards using AMD's technology. This is the thing, yeah? Volta is gonna come around with HBM and asynchronous compute done properly. And I simply don't know how Vega can compete against that. So that is where my disappointment lies, but I simply cannot continue to ignore the facts that AMD are presenting to us themselves. In the Star Wars Battlefront demo, Polaris 11 was running around 60 frames per second. I know because I tested it. In Hitman, it was running around 60 frames per second. V-Sync on in both cases, but the Polaris 10 GPU could not possibly have been performing much higher than 60 frames per second there. And now they've shown us Battlefront again on the Ender map again with a 60 frame per second cap. I do not believe that that Vega card was running much higher than 60 frames per second. But in the end, the big one is the Doom demo. They have shown us it running at between 60 and 80. There is always a chance that they are sandbagging, but if they are, then they have just started sandbagging right now. And you have to ask yourself, honestly, what is the point in it? What is the point in them sandbagging performance? There is simply no good reason for it. All of this time, I have been assuming that Vega would be AMD's last great hope 
at winning over the minds of the consumers. This is the major disappointment to me. I was sure that AMD would create a monster 600 square millimeter GPU using the HBM that they developed, cramming the GPU full of shaders and just blowing Nvidia away. One last hurrah even, but that is not what they did. They have used HBM for this high bandwidth cache thing. They have left performance on the table because Vega is below 500 square millimeters. But as far as I'm concerned, there is not enough space left. If you take the maximum at 610 square millimeters, which is what Nvidia's Tesla Pascal is, there simply isn't enough room there to really improve on Vega. And that to me simply says that AMD is pretty much giving up on beating Nvidia. They simply never had the consumer mind share. And even if they had been 50% faster than the Titan X, there is still a fair chance that they would have been outsold by the Nvidia card. It's a shitty situation, but this is what it is, and it's one that we have created. If I am wrong about any video, if I am ever proven really, really wrong about a video, I hope it was my previous one, and that Vega is fast enough. Somehow through drivers, if AMD is sandbagging, great. I will take that in a heartbeat for the sake of seeing competition and better prices and PC gaming continuing, but I just don't think so. I'll catch you later, guys.